Hello, we are in conversation today with journalist and writer Carlo Bizzati about his latest book, Marple, where he talks about his journey in India when he landed in 2008 as one of those yoga people and how now he's become a Marple or a son-in-law in South India. That's right, correct. <laughs> Marple. <laughs> That's me. Hello, Carlo. Hello, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I want to say I really enjoyed reading your book. Great, great. And there was this... Um, I was very reminded of Shantaram yes. and his life. Oh, really? Life. I'm like the the soft version of Shantaram. Yeah, Shantaram, yeah. there is no like rough stuff in the prisons yeah. or anything like that, right? And you don't have like a crime. <laughs> no, 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 no. And I wouldn't write it anyway. So, <laughs> so would you share with us one really crazy or an extraordinary incident or in your rather extraordinary life? Oh, I I one particular. Oh, well, in Mapile, you mean? Or what is most extraordinary in Mapile? In I think what's most extraordinary in Mapile, which is important, is that um, uh, for some, I was actually told by an editor in Italy that I should write my extraordinary life. And so for me to have found an ordinary life in India in a family as a Mapile is a very extraordinary thing. So that's what's extraordinary for me because I have lived the extraordinary things before, meaning that I have had adventures as a journalist in Latin America, in New York, all over the world where I've lived. And here I found some sort of uh, normal life in a way within a family and and so the most extraordinary thing can be that they burn some plastic upwind and I go out and tell them not to burn you know like it could be a very normal thing uh, so I think that the, my experience here in India everything is extraordinary in India very often because it's, it's a, such a very rich continent full of surprises so I don't know if I can point out one thing in particular except this very ordinary extraordinary life you thought you could flatter your importance of the white man syndrome that you get. Yes, I wanted to, so this is a, um, a serious book in funny clothes, so I wanted to, um, uh, in, in, within the context of migrant literature, because you know very often when white people move away, they're called expats instead of immigrants, and instead I'm an immigrant. Uh, I'm not an expat, because uh, when people from the browner race come to Europe, they're called migrants, not expats. I think we're all migrants. And I am a privileged migrant, because here there is some sort of reverse discrimination that I benefit from sometimes uh, in being white, definitely. There is some white privilege, definitely. Uh, uh, but also, I think that India is de definitely maturing, uh, and especially in the metropolitan context context in that regard. But uh, it is for fortunate to be here and to be welcomed and to be in a very harmonious context. But yes, I think that, that definitely there are some great, ad great advantages uh, in, in being a white immigrant in India still, I suppose. I don't know, a little bit could be some uh, colonial, post-colonial hang-ups that are still lingering in India. Uh, a little bit it's because there is also a very big maturity in Indian uh, philosophy and history. So I think on the one hand, yes, you could say there is this inferiority, superiority c conflict and tension that, gets, uh, that, that, that it's still there. But on the other hand, in very, it's very possible that there is also a country with a millennial history with a billion, 300, uh, 300 million people. We're so often reminded about the, the size of the country that has a sort of a, um, historical and demographic muscle that it can take all different races to teach you. And like Shantaram, you also had another name, but he found his name and you created your own name. Which Hash is? Sadaka. I, it's true. I didn't think about that. That's, uh, that's interesting that you have seen that. I didn't think about that. Thank you. Good, good uh, observation. Yes, I, I jokingly said that because I was told that I um, might have had to change my name to a Hindu name if I wanted to get married in India with my wife. And then we finally, luckily, we found an Arya Samaj ceremony. But before that, I was thinking, even though you're supposed to be given a Hindu name, even though you're supposed to be born a Hindu, of course, I know that. But uh, I was just playing a little bit with my imagination and thinking what kind of name would I find. And uh, I liked Harsh Sadaka because 
It is also, on the one hand, it means the pleasure seeker, which is the title of my wife's first novel, so I thought it made sense. But it's also, I also understand in a, that it's in a, in a different way, the pleasure of illumination, the pleasure of santoshi, of contentment. So seeking that sort of uh, enlightenment, not necessarily sensual pleasure. You have a disclaimer throughout the book, this is not an India book, I yeah. don't know India, yeah. yet it is a book about India, would you? Well, yeah, that was sneaky of me, wasn't it? Because uh, there are so many people who are better qualified to talk about India who are Indologists and, uh, and there are so many people who come to India for a couple of months and then they go back to Europe and they are enlightened and they have to explain what India is about. And I'm sure that in India you've kind of had enough of people like that. So I, don't, I didn't think I needed to, um, to be one more of, the, of those people. And I, th I thought I would just try to... Uh, uh, explain what I saw and what I experienced, that it would be more honest as a writer, and which is what I've always done. Uh, so, yeah, I didn't, I guess, yeah, I just explained that it is always my point of view, so I'm not trying to draw any great conclusion about, and so even in the last chapter of Future of India, I try, I try, I try to make fun a little bit about futurologists and all that. Mm -hmm. Um, as a journalist, the India we're living in, you would know quite well because this is Modi's fundamentalist India. So, what do you fear most about this new India and where do you think it is going? Well, personally, I, I don't fear anything in that respect. I have not felt threatened. I, I have written very openly in Italian newspapers and in, uh, in, in Indian media about what I think, and I have never ha felt any threat personally. But I know what's happening to colleague journalists, uh, obviously, and, and I think that, that there needs to be um, a change in uh, the legislation which needs to defend journalists. But this has to happen globally, but it has to happen in India very soon too. So I speak particularly about my category. I, ju I do think that there needs to be stricter laws to protect journalists. So there should be faster trials to try people who uh, harass and kill journalists. Uh, just like it has happened in other walks of life, uh, there has to be an awareness that journalists are indispensable to democracy. So this is one specific topic that I feel strongly about, of course. As for the rest, I think that the f fundamentalism here in southern India is not so evident as it is in the north. So the Gaurakshas activities, for example, and their violent, violent angle of the Gaurakshas activities is not evident here in Tamil Nadu where you have a Dravidian po political parties facing each other and you have a completely different uh, political context, I think. So um, I don't experience it directly, personally. I experience it, experience it as an observer who travels around India and who follows the news and reports the news, of course, for Italian newspapers. And um, I find it it's also interesting, not necessarily in a positive way. Everyone has the right um, to go in the direction that they, that they want, the majority in a democracy, of course. But it is interesting that there is a contradiction, again, of modernization and wanting to, uh, w through technology, modernize and at the same time uh, go towards a fun ir irrational fundamentalism. But um, that's, again, uh, as long as it is non-violent, and that is the problem, isn't it? As long as it is non-violent, it's one more contradiction of India. Once it turns violent, there is a problem and legislation has to intervene. And I think the Supreme Court has been doing a very good job at that. There are so many Indias. There's a tangible, smellable, real India. There is an imaginary, literary, dreamed India. So it's so many Indias and you're living between all these Indias. Yeah. How do you find a balance? Well, yeah, this, I, was, I was writing that because definitely before coming to India, um, I definitely had a very clear image of what I thought India was and, and it had an importance and I think this is true of a lot of people around the world who have not come to India. India is in a way a state of mind, it's a, it's a, it's a hope also for people, for a lot of sick people also in a way, people who are either uh, in, a, in a physical tension or in a psychological tension, they always think that they'll come to India and they'll find an answer. I mean, in a way I did, I also come here as a yoga people looking for an answer and I did find an answer. I mean, I found an answer uh, to those questions, but I found an answer I wasn't looking for, which is I found love and I wasn't looking for that. So that, that, that was an interesting answer that India had to give me. So, yeah, I suppose that mm, uh, it's, it's a very, very unique culture, very st strong and ancient culture that has a lot to give. And, and the problem is that 
because it has so many facets, uh, everybody like in a Rorschach test uh, sees whatever they want. And there is something very real, very tangible. It's, sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's tragic. Something, sometimes it's very open and equal, sometimes it's very unequal. And so it's very, very difficult to put a, a, a shape to it, which is what's charming about it to me. So in the last decade that you've been here, how has your perception towards caste and caste inequalities changed? And do you see it changing among the new Indians in the new India? How has it evolved? Caste, yes. Well, I think that Europeans uh, very often, and Westerners in general, always think that there are like just four castes. And then as you come here, you discover the myriad of differences. And you see the, when the, the workers come to the house and they immediately know uh, who's above, who's below, and uh, it's very fascinating to discover that it, it's maybe it's sad. I don't try to push a, a, judge, a judgment. It, it is sad, of course, but I also understand that within this system it works that way, and it found a way of making the system work with this taxonomy, this you know distribution of power uh, fragmented in these so many castes. Uh, well, I mean, from my point of view, of course, how I grew up with my mentality, it's difficult to accept that. Uh, but I, again, try to understand w how in 2018 India can cohabit with that. And ha is it changing? Uh, maybe, but in which direction? Not necessarily in the Western direction. Um, and the, what about the new India then? The new Indians, like the 30-something, 40-something entrepreneurs or business people or people who are trying to, to make a, a life for themselves and be participants in the change of the... Of, of, of the country. Um, I'm not sure that, that, that they reject the caste system wholeheartedly. There might be some uh, the people who are into intellectual activities, for example, but on average, uh, I don't know if they're willing to, to change that system necessarily because they benefit from it, of course. And again, because there is no strong request from the lower caste. There is a strong request on certain organi organizations, but I'm not so sure that Mm, that there is going to be necessarily a change in India. And also, if, you, if we look at Indian history, uh, because of the cyclical nature of change, uh, one has to ask oneself also how long it would be if there were a change to come about. You know? But uh, I'm not, personally, I'm not seeing that there is any, um, any radical change. We've seen some good signs here after the floods in Chennai in which the um, s uh, different castes were affected uh, similarly by the floods and you've had some sort of collaboration and some sort of barrier being broken between Brahmins and Dalit, for example, in that context. So you can always think that a collective trauma could bring some change, uh, but I don't know, I, I couldn't be, be, become too enthusiastic about it, otherwise I would not, I would not be Indianized. So my Indianized answer is, I'm not sure if anything will change. <laughs> what I really liked about the book is there was a lot of acceptance, a great mm. deal of acceptance in what you saw about India. Yeah. But was there a time when you found it really hard, when you were struggling to get acclimatized to something, any particular aspect? You Aside from loose motions, you mean, and uh, yes. getting the deli belly? Yeah, that, I found that particularly hard in the beginning. <laughs> the, the those, of course, yes, in the beginning. Aside, jo jokes aside, I think that, uh, I don't know, I mean, um, traffic is insane, I got used to it. I think, I think somehow I have, I have it's, it's hard to answer this question now because I feel I have uh, gotten used to so many things and so now uh, the things that, that used to irritate me they, they, they don't irritate me so much. Um, in the beginning it was uh, the Indian queue which is very similar to the Italian queue so I should be prepared, I should know what it's like because I, I used to do that in Italy all the time to elbow my way through because we're the same in, that, in many respects and in, even in, in not respecting the queue in the British sense of the term. Uh, so, but that got a bit irritating, of course, like every other Gora or Velle who complains about that. Um, but I don't know if I find, I mean, there are certain things that, that the system, the inequality of the system are very difficult to take, of course. Uh, I, I, okay, yes, I did find difficult to see that the people who are the subjects of inequality are the ones who endorse the system. I also understand why. Yeah. 
uh, and the religious subtext of that, I still find it uh, humanly it's a little difficult to accept that um, there is no conscience of, of trying to change it. That is, that is widespread. Of course there is conscience, the Dalit movement and everything that is happening in India right now, but uh, not widespread enough. And you still, in, especially in rural areas, find that their level of acceptance should diminish somehow. And so as a recovering Orientalist, as you described yourself in the yeah. book, was there any cultural shock, per se, that you had to... With India? Within India? This was one of them, definitely the one, the cultural shocks that I that I had, the the ones of inequality. But I was kind of prepared because I had read about it and I, I was coming, ex accepting, ex ex expecting that this was was going to happen. Um, I don't know if there are that many things that I. I mean, there are positive cultural shocks. For example, teaching at the university, seeing the level of respect that the students have for the teachers compared to the universities in Europe, seeing the level of uh, commitment the students have so, um, towards their studies compared to many European universities, sometimes American universities as well, uh, that's a positive culture shock. Let's say, oh wow, there are people that are really committed to their studies and they understand that it's going to make a difference in their lives, and which is what I've always thought because this is how I lived my studies. So how would you describe Chennai particularly, since you're a Chennai Maple? As a very boring metropolis, as we all know. I mean, it's probably the most boring metropolis that is there is in India. Is it changing like the rest of India? Yeah, I think it is, and I actually don't know it. I'm saying just to provoke a little bit that it is boring. I think it's, I mean that it is provincial, sedated and calm, sedated in a positive way, in the sense that it's very relaxing compared to the hustle and bustle of other cities that I've seen. And it has its hustle and bustle areas. I was just asked recently to you know, give five spots of Chennai because it is difficult to appre appreciate it on a, f a face value. Like Mumbai, it's easy. You go to Kolaba, you go for a walk immediate. Delhi, you go and see the, the right spots and in Kolkata also uh, there are the typical places where you can just go and you immediately understand the city. Here you can go to Marina Beach. I don't know if you can be charmed necessarily immediately by that, but if you know when, where to go around the Mylapur temple at sunset for a walk, where you know the little dive around here in Bazan Nagar where you can have the right masala dosa with good filter coffee in the morning. Uh, I mean, uh, there are a few beautiful little, I like sour carpet, for example, uh, sour carpet, uh, which is not very Tamil, of course, because it's northern India, So, but it's a surprise to see this mixture of North India in South India. It's full of little surprises. So what, it, what I like about it, it, it is that it is boring, meaning that it is more relaxing, it is less, it attacks your, your nervous system a little less, except when you're driving, of course, because it, is, it has the wor worst traffic in India, I, I'm convinced. So, and I explain in the book why that is. Okay. So you said, this is very, one of my favorite lines from your book, so after leading an extraordinary and uncommon life, you begin to see how appealing normalcy is. Would you agree with me in your descriptions of Paramangani and, and your beach house there? There is a bit of an exotic end. It is pretty uncommon for someone like me, if you're coming from another part of the city, driving down the ECR, going beyond is rather not very an everyday thing. It is definitely a bit, bit exotic. And your descriptions make it sound far more extraordinary than I think you would. Dis you call it an isolated fishing village in the tropics in the Bay of Bengal, to be precise. But I think there is a description of the exotic. And would you agree that you found something extraordinary there? Yes, I think, yeah, yeah, of course. But what I wanted to clarify is what I found uh, um, extraordinary in the normalcy, it's mostly here uh, in the family life. So that's what I found extraordinary in its normalcy. The fact of being uh, in a harmonious family, like my in-laws and my wife's family. And, and it's very pleasant for me to, it's not ordinary, it's not boring, but it's very brilliant and fun people to be with. But uh, the fact that there is no conflict, that there is harmony, uh, which, which is what you could define as nor normalcy to a certain degree. And so I, for me, that was extraordinary for me to find that. Now, life down in uh, uh, the beach house is extra extraordinary because it takes a certain kind of person to be able to live in that kind of isolation. So, and the context is, ex it is exotic because it is so isolated and we, our neighbors are, fishermen who get up early in the morning and fish out in a very beautiful 
uh, Bay of Bengal and we do go for walks even this morning we were there and, and that beautiful golden light it's amazing with these three beach dogs and then we get attacked by the stray, other stray dogs and um, nothing dramatic happens it's a uh, we are very much in nature. There are snakes, there are rats, there are monkeys that come once in a while. And yes, of course, it's a little bit jungle book in that way. So it is, yeah, uh, exotic. It is, uh, I think it, the exoticism is always within you in the sense that if you, it's, a beco it's become a bad word, exoticism, of course, but to just salvage it again, I think that it can be within you and you can find it even in places that are not so isolated and, and, and magic, like the one I have the fortune of sharing with my wife. I think that it, it takes a lot of point of view and how you live within your context to bring out some exoticism. So I think it can be found in other places as well. This is a particularly um, genuinely exotic place, I suppose, even, within, even for Indians, definitely, who live in Chennai. So Carlo, you came to Chennai, India, for love. And can you say you also fallen in love? Actually, I did not come to India for love. I came in, in, to, in India to uh, do entirely different things, yoga, meditation, but I f found the person I fell in love with in India. So, yeah, I didn't come here. I, I guess I stayed for love, definitely. And I was very much in that in love phase with Chennai also in the beginning and smelling the jasmine in the trees and just looking at the sky, driving around the wonderful... Uh, road of Besan Nagar or uh, walking around the Theosophical Society. But I think I've normalized now. Now I'm a, I, I've Indianized and I've been here 10 years. And so I've become a normal, grumpy, middle-aged uncle, which is like luckily a normalization, right? So with some good, happy moment at times also. <laughs> Thank you for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you.